Welcome back to another episode of the debrief. Uh, the season's over, but we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up doing a uh, I guess an ask me anything episode. Uh, it's pretty early, so I'm <laughs> I'm already off. The, <laughs> I'm already out of the out of the. Um, uh, I'm, I'm already off. I've already swerved off the track on this one. But anyway, uh, I'm Tyler Norton, the guy behind Plastic Weekly, and joining as always is John Bergman, uh, covering uh, climbing and uh, competition climbing, and of course the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. It's almost the holiday season, and if you enjoy watching this show, you have to have a copy of this book by now. If not, please check the link in the description where you can uh, buy the book or you can find it on uh, an ebook for whatever kind of device you read on. Is that my uh, – Is that, I'm trying to see what's going on here. It looks like you're wearing a headlamp or something. The, the sun is coming through the window behind me at the perfect angle. You have a, um, a nice halo. So I'll we'll ask one of the questions. You'll answer it, and I'll I'll close up my blinds, okay. um, and we'll figure it out. And hopefully, it doesn't make too much noise. Anyway, yeah, we're uh, we're here to uh, to answer some questions that everybody submitted uh, over uh, the last couple of weeks. For the most part, they're in from Instagram and Discord. So thanks for submitting those. We've called them down a little bit. Some of them were not coherent at all, uh, and then and then some of them we have in the back pocket just in case we want to use them. But otherwise, we got quite a few, so we'll save some for uh, for next time. Uh, but in the meantime, John, I just wanted to see how you were holding up and and what you're working on now that the uh, now that the international season is over. Like how you how you keeping busy in in journalism land? Yes, um, it's uh, the season's over. I've still got a couple of things that I'm working on related to competitors of the past season, some profiles and stuff, uh, articles and whatnot that will be coming out in upcoming issues or online for Jim Climber, Climbing Magazine, that type of thing. And then I should say that, I don't know if we've ever touted it here before, but Climbing Business Journal puts together what's called its annual Gyms and Trends report that looks at uh, gym growth and evolution for the past year, in this case, 2021, um, just gyms that have opened, gyms that have closed, what's the growth rate of the industry, what are kind of some things that gyms are doing in a, in a large scale way that can be measured, amenities and whatnot. Uh, it's really interesting, especially for people that kind of like that behind the scenes sort of stuff of the industry. So that will, we're kind of starting to put that together at Climbing Business Journal now. We usually release it uh, very early in, an, in the new year. So probably, who knows, January, February, something 2022 but going in starting to work on that which is cool so people could keep an eye out for that at climbing business journal cool yeah i look forward to that all the time yeah it's a good yeah. one um, yeah, yeah and people I, sh I should specify it's it's only american and canadian gyms in some cases we talk about mexico stuff it's north american gyms simply because we don't you know to to do the whole world would in, entail a, a much more massive staff and stuff um but Certainly, anybody that's interested in the North American scene. Would probably a lot of those, it. a lot of those European countries don't speak American, man. So you know, it gets a lot harder to talk to them. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, uh, cool, man. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I'm, I'm looking forward to some of the profiles that you've been talking about. That's going to be interesting. Um, all right, well, let's uh, let's let's dive into some of these questions. Uh, so the first three I grouped together because they were very similar. Um, so I'm going to read all three. Uh, so first from Tiny Climber on Instagram. What are some trends we see coming down the pipeline regarding competition setting? From Robbie on Discord, crack climbing became a trend for this year's comp climbs. Do you think it'll stay for future comps? What's the next climbing trend in comps? And from Unsocial Sloth on Instagram, will outdoor style climbs make a resurgence in comps? Or is it parkour for the foreseeable future? So just trend, oh, wow. trends in general, and we should probably address cracks specifically and parkoury versus outdoorsy stuff in particular. I'm curious what John thinks to start. Great, great questions, everybody. Really, thanks for submitting all those. There's, you could do a whole episode about any of those questions. Honestly, a lot of these questions, not just these ones, but more in the future, are like soothsayer, like oracle questions where we can't possibly have an answer and we're just taking an absolute stab into the dark. So good luck with answering this one. Yeah, well, in terms of trends, I think the 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 only I'm going to fix have, my window. You keep talking, yeah, yeah. all right? I I think in terms of trends, the only thing we really have to look at is some of the things that we have seen over this past year and 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 thus things that we can expect to kind of continue into the future. Related to that other question, 
one of the biggest trends that we've seen is is cracks, uh, you know, hand jams and that type of thing being part of bouldering bouldering rounds and and also I'm sure around the country there's been some comps that have included some cracks in in lead round lead rounds and stuff like that. That is a I don't know if I see the crack hand jam trend continuing to the degree that it has. I, I mean, I think at first it was kind of such a surprise to have to 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 have it um, to see the cracks in such a significant way with Adam Andre winning the the World Cup because of it and stuff like that. And I think the reverberation of that was we had route setters everywhere kind of wanting to stick a crack into their into their set. I don't know if it's going to continue like that in the in the future to that extent. I think we might always see one every now and then, but uh, I don't know. We can talk more about the cracks in, in a second. The, another trend that I see, I, I noticed it at the national team trials and then also at the Olympics a little bit was what I would describe as dynamic slab, I guess, which means it's, it's, it's a, a boulder that starts slabby, but then finishes at the end with some sort of, coordination move or dynamic move we hadn't really seen those on the circuit to the extent that at least me i noticed them this past year uh really a hybrid style of of slab dino boulder i think those will definitely continue because i think this trend towards coordination moves is not going away anytime soon and we can get into that as well that's kind of another question the old, the other trend that I think we noticed this past year and I think will continue is some more dynamic movement and coordination movement in lead routes. The the main thing that I that I think of is I think it was the women's final at Innsbruck this past year, lead final, finished with like a triple dino or something like that. And, and if tried I were to, yeah. tried to, yeah, because yeah. I think I, I think Yanya ended up breaking it. Um, but I I think that was the first time that I can remember having a triple dino in a lead route, at least in such a prominent place in a lead route. It, it used to be years ago when we said this parkour style, we, what we kind of meant was parkour style isolated in the bouldering discipline. But I do think that that, that parkour street style, whatever you want to call it is going to continue to infiltrate lead routes to an even greater degree in the future. So I, my, my first impression with this question was like in 2013, I made a bet with somebody that within five years, so so by 2018, there would be moving holds in IFSC competitions. Because at that time, like, you know, people were messing around with it on Instagram and like none of it was polished like that 360 spinning volume that exists today and stuff. But anyway, that's 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 my history of predicting what the future of root setting would be has clearly been a failure. Um, but who knows, man, like if, if it can be done in a way that's safe and that you can dial it in in a certain way, I think it would be interesting. Yeah. I don't, I think, I think we'll keep seeing cracks. I don't think it's ever going to be become a huge thing. I think the fun thing about it, honestly, is I think there is a certain amount of ego from a root setter perspective of being able to force those moves. Like, I mean, root setters are creative people and, and I, they have a job to do, but I think they do get off kind of on like, can we make this work like can we force it and then can we also get the athletes to send it so i think you'll still keep seeing cracks here and there until it becomes like easy for root setters to put up right i think i think they'll have their own personal incentive for stuff like that in terms of like out outdoorsy moves first of all i'm a terrible person to ask because i don't spend any time climbing outside anymore um, but when we talk about like the outdoor vocabulary, like we talk about crack climbing or we talk about, I don't even know what you, what you want to say, like chimney climbing or, or like off with stuff. I find a, a lot of that stuff, um, like isn't, it's, it's not just outdoorsy. It's just, uh, it's, it's hard to set without really big tools, right? Like to create a chimney, like I'm trying to think of maybe it was Vail, in the last few years, they had those giant three-dimensional rail volumes coming out. And so you're kind of like stemming between the two of them or into the corner, things like that. It's just you don't have a lot of opportunities. You need like really big holds to recreate things like that. Otherwise, what are we talking about when we talk about like outdoor style climbs? Like, I don't know. We can start putting like spiders' nests inside pockets just to free yeah. that. To me, that's outdoor style climbing. It's just animals living inside the holds you're trying to hold on to. Well, but. I think the... Part of this question is related, if I remember correctly, the second part of that question was something like, is parkour here to stay? Which would, sure. to me, would mean like when, when we say outdoor style, I think it means kind of stuff like straight up 
crimp ladders sure, and stuff yeah, like okay. that and and how the routes really used to look in the 90s and whatnot right compared to how i, I think that would be akin to a more yes, outdoor I agree. style i agree insets are not coming back <laughs> that's, that's I, a, <laughs> and, no I, yeah well okay on, on parkour stuff i think there is a, like i think there's still room to go like what i guess the the question is like in 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 my opinion is where do we think athletes aren't comfortable um and how could that be used to um, affect like separation, right? And so I am really interested in how um, some of those bigger dynamic movements that you might see in American Ninja Warrior, where you get like these really big lateral movements, but you could do it off jugs. But even though it's off jugs, you do have to have like a vocabulary of how you move your body to create that much momentum over such a long distance. Um, I know some of it can be height dependent and stuff like that, but I think there's room for that. Um, I, uh, you know, you, I, so I, I think there's still room to, to, to push the parkour stuff even further than it is. Um, I would agree. And to answer the question bluntly to, is the parkour style going away? Absolutely not. Because I think what you have to think about is the parkour style is an extension of the type of holds that are available and the type of holds that came on the market that, that prompted this parkour, whatever, this boom in the parkour style, particularly large volumes, right? Which had been on the market, of course, since, I don't know, like the early 90s, uh, but or at least had been utilized um, decades ago, but really started to become really popular with route setting over the past... 10 years, five years, 10 years, something like that. And the volumes, what, what they do is they create more surface area. So that surface area, if you think of the flat surface on a volume, that's more surface area that you can launch from and do something dynamically. And that's also more surface area that you can grab onto or try to grab onto. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the parkour style in other words, is a direct extension of the rise of volumes being used so prevalently on the walls. And as long as volumes are around and are used to this degree in route setting, I don't see how the parkour style goes away at all because it's to me it's kind of inseparable from the volumes themselves. So yeah. um, I, I can't imagine that all of a sudden people stop selling volumes and whatnot and go back to selling – crimps and edges yeah and and, slim edges and stuff and like the that. last thing just to just to like clarify is that it's not like there's this there was a day where all of a sudden somebody had the idea to do like let's do parkour right like it it is it has been just a gradual increase over time of basically dynamic movement is really what we're talking about and you can go back and find athlete interviews like post comp debrief interviews where some of the best athletes in history are complaining about little straight up two hand dinos to jugs and saying like, that's, you know, I don't think that's climbing, right? You can find that stuff where as, as this movement of dynamic, uh, uh, dynamic moves being added to comps has increased, it makes people uncomfortable. And it, it, that's the whole point is that's why it's being used. It makes the best athletes uncomfortable and it forces them to do stuff. So I think it's here, it's here to stay. It's really just increasing. Um, and you know, maybe some other giant movement will come out that I, you know, have never heard of or can't think of or whatever, but, um, yeah. It, another thing that I, I, I just want to say is also think about the, the, the amount of time that this dynamic parkour style, which is what we're calling it has been in vogue and been popular. It's been for a while now to the point where you're having a whole new generation of route setters coming up where they don't know any other style other than that style being popular right it's mm -hmm. not like you have i mean of course there are some route setters that were setting in the in the 90s and stuff like that, yes. that pre pre parkour but then there are also plenty of setters that just started three years ago five years ago and whatnot and and so this parkour style is very much ingrained in what they think of in terms of just route setting in general which it just reinforces this point that it's not going to disappear because now it's part of a lot of route setters uh, education and kind of DNA. So, yeah. Yeah. Keep in mind that the route setters that are making the decision to include these moves are older than you are and crustier than you are. And their outdoor tick list is longer and stronger than yours. And they started 30 years ago or more than that climbing, just like climbing routes. 
Um, and now they're all in on this shit and they're the ones putting it up, right? So, yeah. But uh, anyway, I know that people yeah. asking the question probably weren't complaining about it. So sorry if that seemed like a hostile response. But anyway, yeah. No, I, all good, good questions. Those yeah. were great. All right. Uh, from, from Nate in the Discord, he gets two because he pays money. Um, if you could merge comp climbing with another sport to create a new sport, what sport would it be? And what would this combined sport look like? So I'll start with this one. So John has a chance to think about it because mm. I saw this one ahead of time and I, I was really curious. So the first thing I thought was, and neither of these are like groundbreaking ideas, but the first one I thought was adding it to something like a triathlon um, because I love the idea of just having to go through multiple mediums and you're just still racing. And then at the end of, you know, you, what's the last thing in triathlon cycling? No running, running, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so after, after like hours of, of, of swimming and cycling and running, and then you just approach an actual wall and you, you know, got to get up. So the finish is at the top of this, this kind of like, um, I guess it wouldn't be a speed wall. It would probably be top roped and pretty easy frankly at that point like you see the guys ready to puke at the end of a, a triathlon as it is so i don't want to make it too hard but i think it would be like a great finish um but logistically then you start to realize okay there could be like 40 athletes all at once trying to get up a wall so you're like okay maybe that's not a great idea so anyway the the one i landed on was um combining climbing and diving to do a kind of like cliff diving thing and what I think would make it interesting is then uh, the way we judge um, diving qualitatively, right? Like it, it is about like how well you perform it. If the climb is standard or if it's, you know, standard over a period, um, I think it would be really interesting to see somebody have to climb a wall and then dive off it and make both parts beautiful uh, and uh, and maybe use different approaches or like what, you know, what type of uh, uh, approach are they going to take on the climb in terms of their beta and then how are they going to jump off it? And I think it would require fairly little infrastructure. It's like one wall over a pool, which people are already building. So, so yeah, simulated cliff diving is, uh, is, is my final answer because I couldn't figure out a way to, uh, to, to combine it with roller skating, which just sounded madly unsafe, uh, or or archery, which would be super fun, but um, I, I'd be very difficult. Yeah, I, my personally, the in terms of the sports I I also love, it'd be like tennis and climbing or something, which would not go well together. So I'll have to. <laughs> but I will say, when you mentioned the triathlon, I think that is probably what I would say to this question because I've actually thought about this before, how okay if you think about a triathlon let's say take away cycling and include climbing in the triathlon so you have um you have swimming climbing and and running to me i think that is is more kind of true to the spirit of a triathlon in the sense that those are the three options for for local human locomotion, right? You can either run across something, you can climb over it, or you can swim across it. That's it. And and I think climbing, in a sense, fits together better with those other triathlon sports, swimming and running, than cycling, because cycling brings in artificial lo locomotion sure. with a bike, right? So I think I, I've often thought that if you wanted to make kind of a, a triathlon that's true to the spirit of just natural human movement, it would be swimming climbing and and running um and and take away cycling so i think that would be kind of cool and and i think it could be pretty popular you could do it in some cool outdoor places and whatnot so that is probably my answer take out cycling in the in the triathlon and put in climbing i will say it's not exactly his question but one of the things i i think would be neat is to figure out a way how the idea of a relay can be implemented in speed climbing it, 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 um because because we always say that speed climbing is more akin to kind of track and field a sprint than it is to mountaineering or anything like that and of course relays are a big part of track and field i don't know how that would work obviously you couldn't hand a baton like you would in track but maybe you could have some sort of velcro vest or something that you had to attach a, a flag to it for you know and then the other guy would climb and then he'd get lowered and then attach the flag to somebody else who would climb i don't know i just think relays are kind of this 
area of speed climbing that haven't been explored yet, to my knowledge. You could and just you could drop the baton from the top of the wall to your to teammate it. below you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it takes some innovation, but I think it could be kind of neat. Yeah, 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 that's cool. Good yeah, question, though. The, how would you how would you implement climbing into the triathlon though? Because that was the sticking point for me. I was, I was like, wait, a lot of people do this. So, do we have them all race up to like a dam that has like a standardized five three on it, like just a bunch of glossy metolius jokes? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, I would, I guess it would be, yeah, you'd have to. It would be, be it would be rough, like unless you unless you just really make it just like a fair like a five zero like staircase kind of thing, just like a scramble yeah. more like, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, you'd have to make it somehow. They swim to a cliff and then they climb up the cliff and then they run on top of the cliff to the finish. That'd be essentially be. Oh, I was thinking the opposite, like have them run up to the base of a dam, <laughs> climb the dam. Try sure. and swim without getting sucked through the dam, and then yeah, finish line somewhere else. So the yeah. stakes are a lot higher for your mental yeah. triathlon. <laughs> Don't get sucked into the dam. True. Yeah. Uh, okay, Dizzy it at Tahoe. Uh, that I'm assuming that's where he's from. Uh, Dizzy it on Discord asks, "What's the fastest you've seen someone progress in climbing in a short time?" This is a friggin' hard question for me. I is I, I think we have to, uh, you have to go, I mean, by what metric, right? That's my kind of question. It's a good question, but I, I think we have to decide, are we talking about progressing from zero to some phenomenal comp result? Or are mm. we talking about just going from off the couch to a to a V grade or something or, or right. a, you know, a, a climbing grade? Um, it, in terms of just getting good grade wise, I, I, I don't think it's that rare. I mean, it certainly takes a lot of talent, but to see a, a, a kid who teenager or something who is pretty athletic, but has never climbed put in six months or a year of climbing and then be close to, you know, whatever V eight V nine, maybe double digits or something like that. I think that that's, um, that is certainly possible and has happened. I remember talking to Diane Russell, who's one of the owners of Pacific edge, the gym in Santa Cruz where Chris Sharma got his start when he was 12 years old or something like that. And she said within eight months, he was climbing up like upper five twelves at the gym, which today might not seem like that out that, that nuts. But back then this is 94, right? When the hardest route in the world was what probably action direct, like five fourteen upper. So I'm the wrong person to ask. I'll take your word for it. Well, to be just, <laughs> just, uh, Two great yeah, away five, from five, the best was, in the world yeah, after yeah, eight yeah. months is is yeah. pretty remarkable. So those those that comes to mind. Now I think if we want to talk about comp results, that's that's a whole different discussion. Yeah, I, I feel like there is. I feel like somebody has mentioned a, an anecdote about a climber who basically came in and like within like a year of climbing was on the World Cup circuit. And I want to say it was Russian, one of the Russian climbers. I might be wrong. Am I am I wrong thinking about maybe it was Alexi or something like that? I might be confusing a bunch of stories, but I don't have a solid answer for this one. Um, Alexi won the Alexi Rubstov won the World Championships bouldering in 2009 yeah. after having been climbing for only four years, which is pretty pretty by itself pretty pretty, good. <laughs> pretty incredible. It's not quite one year. No, as you yeah, said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think I, that's my memory. Of we'll it. we'll I, change that. We'll change the lore. Alexei Rubsov was alive for one year and then won the world championship. Please, uh, people can cr please correct me if I'm wrong, but that is kind of my memory of Alexei, which I that has to be one of the all time fastest progressions to go from not climbing to world champion in four years is it, that's, that, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Kairos climber on Instagram asks, where is I Mori and why hasn't she been competing? I don't know, to be honest. I, I, my, my answer is I'm not sure. I know that people have wondered this people have, I know there's a Reddit thread about it. And in the Reddit thread, somebody says, now this is, it's Reddit. So who knows if this is true or not, yeah. but somebody <laughs> says something like, Oh, it's it's all good. She's just been concentrating. I'm friends with her, and she's been concentrating on school or something like that. I'm paraphrasing what the response was, but that was one of the replies in Reddit. To I don't know. She just she won the Japan Cup in what February, so 
she ha- we have seen her this year, but obviously not on the World Cup circuit. So I wish I had insider knowledge, but I do not. Yeah, I mostly just heard rumors, and and I it's a it's a good question because I think in any other year without um, uh, without the Olympics and stuff, because with with all these World Cups, like you would commonly see a bunch of people absent that you would normally see, and so I think it may have flown under the radar a little bit um, that we had this this star from the previous season not being there. But yeah, I've just heard rumors, um, and uh, yeah, my my impression is that she will be back. Um, but it was just a, a weird year for one or multiple reasons. Um, but yeah, I can't, you know, i it's literally just hearsay, uh, what I've yeah. heard. So I'm not going to bother with that. Cause yeah, no guarantees that I know anything. Um, next one from, uh, from the circuit climbing, uh, on discord, what would be your dream climbing competition venue? So mine i i the the first one which i'll just mention because i think somebody should do it is there's a bunch of little theaters in my neighborhood where like it's like capacity of like i don't know like 700 or less right like one of those small um theaters that are probably you know a century old or maybe a bit more or whatever um where they just have a little stage but i've always wanted to just put a boulder on one of those stages and one of those little neighborhood theaters and host you know if your gym has a, a local competition or even a regional competition but then do the finals in a theater um i always thought that would be such a neat atmosphere just you know you could do one of those those uh, 360 degree boulders and just spin it 90 degrees for each problem just have all the boulders on on one thing um the cleaning bill would be astronomical there'd be chalk <laughs> all over that damn gym man um, yeah. But I've always wanted to do that. But my real answer and and like being from Toronto, so so my answer has to be in Toronto. Um, uh, for those not familiar with the geography, Toronto has a, a bunch of islands just off the coast. So Toronto's on the lake, uh, and then there's a. It's basically a, an old sandbar. Um, so it's just some sandy islands. Some people live on them. For the most part, it's just kind of a big city park. Uh, but the beautiful thing about it is you can look across the water back to the city of Toronto. And at night, it's it's just like stunning because you've got this giant city skyline just looming over you across the water. And so, you know, you think of those incredible shots where at Chamonix, you, you, you look along the side of the walls, the climbers going up and Mont Blanc is up there. The best we can do in Ontario, which is flat as hell, is instead to just, you know, have the wall and then just see a shimmering city across yeah. the water just looming on the, on the, on the horizon. I would... I would, that would be that would be a career highlight if I ever get into organizing World Cups is to do uh, and then the, everybody would have to take the ferry across to the islands so you've got like a boat full of uh, climbers on like it's like a five minute boat ride it's not very long um, but I think that would be so much fun and just an incredible backdrop so that's my dream is bring it back to Toronto not do it in a hockey arena outside the city limits but like do it actually in the city I think would be uh, unbelievable so that's my my dream venue. So what you're saying is if they if they don't if the competitors don't perform well at the competition they can blame it on being seasick from the ferry <laughs> Yeah. There is in fairness there is also a, an airport on the island which uh, you can fly into from regional airports if you want. Uh, uh that would yeah. be cool. No, you, that's a great. It's a good question and that's a that's a cool answer. I think for me I my thing is I'm always trying to push competition climbing into the whatever you want more mainstream sports world or whatever you want to call it so for me you're gonna say like the, rockefeller center or something like that well I close i was gonna say madison <laughs> madison square okay, garden yeah. in new york city which sure. you know is the arguably the most spa- famous sports venue in the world dating back from boxing yeah. matches and all sorts of uh sporting events for uh, through the the 20th century i think it would just be really cool and historic to have climbing join the many other sports that have held events there the many other uh historic legendary athletes that have that have uh had games there been you know in whatever matches there and stuff like that i think that would be awesome and i think it would be great to get a new york city crowd i mean of course madison square garden world famous there'd be people from all over the world but new york city in particular i think it would be cool to get those sports fans to a climbing competition nowadays after there have been several climbing gyms that have opened in new york city over the past few years that are that are doing great. So let's give them a competition. I that, like, I mean, in terms of what it would mean for the sport, if we could fill Madison square garden for a world championship, I feel like that would be a, a pretty remarkable uh, achievement just for the sport. Yeah. Regardless. I think, the, I think the world championship too would be a good 
starting comp to do there just because the marquee name this is the world championships mm -hmm. right i think that would be better than just saying oh it's a world cup or it's a, a national championship as cool as that would be i think the world championship kind of makes sense yeah for the for an inaugural competition there that'd be great for now i feel like all we could do is like fill the village vanguard or some little jazz bar that's that's the kind of capacity we could <laughs> we could handle in new york state also also the rental price is probably all we could handle right now um, hey, jazz bar could be cool too. That's a different direction, but <laughs> smoky and chalky. Just yeah, everybody <laughs> hacking up along. Uh, Stephen Brigster on Instagram. Maybe hey, not. Maybe not the best question, but I've wondered how venues are chosen for World Cups. Um, at the at the bottom of the IFSC website, I think they have like info on on how. Uh, or they have like there's an event organizer's handbook which is great if you're just interested in like the logistics of an event but i think they also lay out a framework of like how they evaluate event proposals which are normally taken like a year a year and a half in advance and i'm like i don't think the process is like that transparent but they try and give you a hint of like what matters to them in terms of choosing a place and and i think you'd you could probably guess what's important to them like one is are you in a place that can get a crowd logistically will you have the people necessary to run this like are you in a place that has a culture of like good volunteers you know will you be able to build a, a safe wall can we get all the athletes to your location right like it can't be in a country where you know a lot of athletes couldn't get access to um but also like is it valuable to sponsors frankly like is it going to put on a good show right um i i think honestly um like I don't, I don't really care that the process isn't that transparent because, you know, frankly, I think that the circuit is pretty good right now, and I don't mind that they lean towards like proven partners because I mean, like, look at the the struggles that we go through in some ways, like just with broadcasts and things like that, and we know for sure there have been World Cups in the last few years where it's kind of a shit show behind the scenes, and those comps don't end up back on the circuit again. So I don't mind them playing it kind of safe at this point um, and just sticking with the the, the people they know. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some information on the website kind of clearing it up. I've, I'm, I don't know anything from like behind the scenes, but I think it's somewhat opaque. Um, and it is just like, you know, do we think we'll be able to make the sponsors happy, make the athletes happy and, uh, have an event actually run smoothly, which is probably harder than, uh, that a lot of people think it is. Yeah. I, I don't have much to add. I don't really know anything beyond what you just said. I think, the national federations in that country play a large part in kind of leading the charge. And I only say that because if you look in the case at USA climbing, uh, for the longest time, the, the world cup that was in the United States was in Vail in Colorado. And then as soon as USA climbing moves its headquarters from Colorado to Utah, Salt Lake city, all of a sudden there's a, a competition, a world cup happening in Salt Lake city. So it would make sense that the, the, the national federation probably plays a large role in choosing the venue and suggesting it to the IFSC and whatnot. Um, of course, because the, the national federation is going to know a lot more about the demographics and the venues in their country than the IFSC would. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know much about it, but that one, that one, I feel like there must be an extra factor in that decision because the, the crowd at the Vail world cups is like, objectively larger now i don't think you could ticket everybody at the Vail world cup like anybody could show up right it was a huge festival there's like tons of stuff going on in Vail over that weekend um but for for the salt lake city world cup it was ticketed right like everybody like yeah. inside the zone had to pay right it was and I, I think it's it's tricky you don't i don't think we want to measure the salt lake crowd to the Vail crowd too much for a couple reasons first of all it was still it was the pandemic right and and so True, that's going to yeah. skew the the number of people that were willing to travel for it. But also because of the pandemic, from what I recall, USA Climbing only made I think it was three thousand tickets available or something like that. And and I think that was a pandemic decision. Like in other words, they uh, normal normal circumstances they would have made a lot right. more tickets available. So it probably would have been a and it was packed when I was there. I think it probably would have been an even larger crowd had it not been for the pandemic. So right, yeah. Um, yeah, it'll it'll be interesting. Hopefully, when we're out of this horrible pandemic and mm. you can go back to normal size crowds and everything, then it'll be really interesting to compare Salt Lake City to Vail for sure. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, all right. Uh, Shade T on Discord. If you could only eat one breakfast cereal for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? <laughs> oh, man. So uh, my, my boring answer, the one that I actually eat right now all the time is like an extremely boring like grocery store brand muesli right now, which is super depressing. Um, but if I like throw it back to childhood, like peak peak breakfast cereal days, it would probably be um, what was that? It was like called um, cranberry almond crunch or something like that. It's like Sounds one good. of those one of those cereals where every component, like both the flake and the cluster and the fruit, has like a, a sheen of sugar, like <laughs> on it. Like it all got sprayed down in a sugar solution before it got boxed, something like that. It sounds delicious and yeah. and sugary. Um, yeah, childhood, my my go to very controversial some people you either love it or you hate it which was apple jacks i loved apple jacks oh yeah and um and i loved cinnamon toast crunch which um i don't know if these are available in in canada but like uh, and and then not to me my parents were the worst my parents wouldn't let me have like any sugary cereal ever it was awful so oh uh, yeah this was a rare occasion for me (laughs) make no mistake this wasn't every (laughs) breakfast but then at some point cinnamon toast crunch gave way to cinnamon life which was um Good That's stuff. New to me. Oh, it's good. Is it like yeah. Life cereal, but the cinnamon version? Is that what we're talking? Exactly. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. I'll have to. I'll, I'll mail you a box or something. Well, we'll do I think f- it's still around. <laughs> we're 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 we're, really, we're gonna have a hell of a food exchange, man. <laughs> I got my yeah. my like my can of apple juice and bag of milk for you, and you're gonna. <laughs> it's gonna be the worst introduction ever. Like, yeah, like yeah. We, we still haven't met each other. We're just gonna hand each other bags full of food. All right. Here's some milk. Here's yeah. a bag of milk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, Shade T, for that question. Plastic Weekly cereal coming next year. Yeah. Yeah. Merchandise. Yeah. What'll it taste like? What What would the Plastic Weekly cereal taste like? I don't know. <laughs> next it would question. probably like the the joke is like it would be super salty. Just you know, like you just go. complaining about everything. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be uh. Um, where are we at? Hal, Hal on Discord. Isn't it time for Plastic Weekly to change its name to Comp Climbing Weekly or something more climbing search friendly? Um, uh, no, Plastic Weekly is like originally uh, it was. Um, I wanted it to be about comps, but I also wanted it to be about like uh, like gym culture is kind of like what I've started calling it because for the most part I was active um, managing a gym and and that's honestly what started it. The comp stuff came. Because a kid who I was close with ended up aging into World Cups. And so I ended up going to some and following it that way. Um, So no, Plastic Weekly, if it ever becomes what it, you know, was like bred to become, will be a a multiple series. So the debrief is all about World Cup climbing with John. um, And the debrief will always be that. But there hopefully will be other shows in the future focusing on different topics. Um, I would love to start talking again to people in different gyms just talking about really boring stuff about how they how they handle their customer experience you know maybe maybe route setting specific shows um stuff like that so plastic weekly will stay uh will stay named this i probably should have just named it like tyler norton climbing if i wanted to really nail the branding but whatever so yeah stay in the way it is but if you have a suggestion let me know um it would be funny if anybody has some 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 good ideas the original name of the podcast was actually going to be four plus um but then they removed the four plus format from bouldering finals and so i decided not to use it and went with plastic weekly so yeah also four plus all the urls were uh related to iphones at the time (laughs) and so it was very hard to get a reasonably priced url uh okay i don't know how to pronounce this name Will D. Goo, Will D. Agu. I know his first name is Will, so we'll call him Will. Um, on Instagram, you get to decide who to invite for a block shop open type competition. Who would you pick? So if you're out of the loop, block shop open is like kind of a regional bouldering comp in Montreal, but they invite some like uh, like maybe like three men and three women like superstar level climbers so um i think melissa leneve was at one i think petra klinger as was at one alex magos maybe uh, uh michael mawam was definitely at one or two of them so let's say if you had to pick like three men three women for a for a boulder comp who would you pick hmm i would say the three 
I, honestly, I would probably just do the uh, assume. You know, let's pretend like Akio didn't retire. It'd probably just give me the Olympic podium. Give me Yanya, Akio, and Miho. I think that'd be sure. uh, really cool to invite those three for the men. Um, let's get Tomoa there. Let's get um, Sean Bailey there, and let's get who would be a third. Um. Hmm. I don't know. Third. Who would be a third place? Tomoa, Sean Bailey. That's an interesting uh that's an interesting duo. Yeah, right. I I'd feel like, like you need him. to invite a European just to just right. to keep it you know balanced. Yeah, it's tricky. I only get one. I'm trying to think. Yeah. Uh, maybe Yurne, just for fun. Yurne Cruder, get him over there. Oh yeah, he'd be great. Like you know, he's great. a party animal. He'd have a great time. Yeah. yeah. Those three and be a solid that'd be a solid that could be the podium right there. So. Yeah, yeah. My my my. So my my two angles were one like who are the people that just have a great time, right? Because like it doesn't really matter who wins. It's like who's going to put on a good show, who's going to interact with the crowd and stuff. But the other one was like just from what I've heard from from the block shop opens is like it's helpful if they don't expect to be like put up in super nice hotels when you invite these people and like people that are like relatively low maintenance. Um, it might be cheaper to get out. So, so I think if it was like in my locale, I think we would have a way to wrangle somebody like Miho Nanaka to come out. I think somebody like Melina Costanza probably doesn't know how, what her actual worth is right now (laughs) because she hasn't really had that like world cup debut. So maybe I'd get her. I feel like she would be like a bargain in terms of, you know, she, she's not on that world cup, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, kind of regard yet, but probably could, could keep up with them so i think i could get miho easily just through a connection i think i could get Nata or um uh, melina up and then um who else could we could we wrangle uh oh well okay so i think alex magos has family nearby uh to where i am so i'm gonna get alex and i'm gonna drag uh jenya kazbakova over with him so that's my three jenny kazbakova miho nanaka and melina costanza because i think i could do it cheaply yeah, I think I think Alex would be a diva, but people still like him, so whatever. So Alex Magos is my first male, and then I think I could get I could get Ray Sugimoto, I think, through the same connection from Miho, and uh, man, who else for the yeah? Like honestly, I you know what Mikael Mawem has done enough of the block shop opens that he clearly has fun doing it, and he is just so much fun to watch and and hang out with. So I think he'd be a great wrap up for those. Yeah, I mean, if you're thinking, I like how you approached it very. Because again, like just just to be clear, like these people aren't showing up to these comps for free, right? Like they didn't just for the most part just come to Montreal on a whim in the middle of their like you know off season. So yeah, I don't well, have if, to pay him too much. If we're if we're thinking about money and travel costs and stuff, then yeah, I would probably say like Melina, like you said, Sean Bailey, Natalia, like bring in these people that are just coming from the States so they don't have to travel. They don't have to fly overseas or anything like that. Right. Uh, But I like your choices. Good stuff. Uh, Okay. Nate with the second question, because he pays money. Um, How do you see comp climbing evolving in the next five or 10 years? I should have grouped this with the, with the ones at the top. How do you see comp climbing evolving in the next? This is a very open-ended question, so we can answer it however we want. Um, five or ten years. So where does that take us to? Five years from now is 2026, and ten years is 2031. That's an awfully long time horizon. Fiberglass has basically become mainstream in that time in the last mm-hmm. ten years, and that has been a huge deal. I don't hmm. – this is tricky I because I don't know if it will continue evolving at the – like the shift as – going back to our first question, the shift to this dynamic style, even though we said it didn't happen, there wasn't like an inciting incident where, where it all of a sudden happened, it has nonetheless been a huge change in the aesthetic, in the style of comp climbing and all that. I don't think – I don't know if we're going to see that big of a shift – again right i think we might kind of plateau a little bit um in terms of that style who knows i mean we're just shooting the breeze maybe maybe i'm wrong i will say to your fiberglass point i would that was, i was just trying to think of things that had changed in the last 10 years so I'm, that's not necessarily where i'm going but yeah no but i wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing 
further more or further experimentation with the surface material for the climbing holds. Um, in other words, stuff like like think about a climbing hold that has a kind of a plastic surface, whether it's dual tech, whether it's, you know, um, friction or, or smooth or whatever, it's still kind of some sort of plastic. I can't help but think like, well, what if you would make some sort of like a little rubber coating or something like that, which would allow for a whole different type of grip. Now, the reason that that isn't done on a large scale is because it's costly and the rubber wears off, would wear, wear off really quickly. So it wouldn't make sense to do it in a gym or something like that. But if you were making holds exclusively for a comp and you're like, okay, these, these holds are just for the Olympics and that's it or something like that, right? One Olympic games and then they're done. You could certainly mess around with different surfaces to coat the holds with. And I think that would be really interesting to see how that would impact the climbers and the movement and stuff like that, whether they're able to grip more, grip less. Um, because you think of something like a soft rubber or a rubber coating would have a, there's a little bit of squeeze to that. And I think you could do some really interesting stuff there. Um, but I don't know. That's just, just kind of thinking out loud. Yeah. Uh, I think that the big one for me is that uh, expect changes in like how qualifications work at competitions like there's just way too many climbers at these things they're already experimenting with the um with the scramble format uh as a qualification so i like i yeah let's say let's say within 10 years yeah guaranteed there's a different qualification structure uh at the competitions to figure out who goes to semifinals or whatever replaces it um yeah i would expect the quota structure to change i think in general it'll become harder to attend uh world cups and um and i think the qualifications will end up being very different and so let's let's say yeah within five or ten years let's expect that athletes will have a big wrench thrown at them in terms of like what competition climbing really is for them um just to to handle it logistically i think they might have to make some some cuts on the format i don't think five on five off can survive as a qualification round. I know people have suggested like another intermediate round, but I'm not sure we're at a spot where most event organizers could do another day that isn't televised and doesn't get you like any sponsorship benefit. Right. Um, Hmm. yeah. Yeah. The logistics of holding a comp for any gym, you figure you have to close this, the gym, at least for a couple, depending on how big the comp is, you have to close the gym, for a few a few days beforehand, if not a whole week beforehand, to give the route setters time to go in there and create the the boulders or the routes, forerun them, tweak them. So it's it's a, it's a big loss for a gym in terms of revenue because while the gym is closed, you don't have people coming in paying for day passes and all that. And it also, although a lot of members might think it's cool that you're holding this comp, a lot of members are probably frustrated that the gym is closed, and so you can alienate some of your membership too. It's a real tricky thing for gym, gym owners to, to hold these comps. So Mm -hmm. yeah, good point. Uh, blue death 11 on Instagram is climbing about to experience a performance enhancing drug scandal. It happens in all sports. So more, uh, more fortune telling do, (laughs) is it about to happen, John? It will happen. I don't know if I don't know if I want to say about to happen. That yeah. could be it could be one years. It could be ten years. I I will say when I I wrote an article, I, not to like tout my own stuff, but I did write an article about this in Jim Climber, and the surprising impression I got when I tried to talk interview coaches and competitors and stuff, a lot of them were very naive in the sense of thinking oh this will never happen in climbing like climbing it's too communal it's too this it's too that to me that seems like a very outdated thinking especially now that it's an olympic sport and all of this it's it's i'm not saying that everybody thinks that by any means but i did talk to some people that seem to think like it would never happen in climbing and i think that's ridiculous it happens in every sport and so it i think i think the best thing we can do now is start thinking about this and start thinking about what should the punishment be? What should the protocols be for this? So when it does happen and it will at some point, we're not caught off guard and thinking like, Oh, how did we not see this coming? Right. It's like, well, no, the time is now we should start thinking about what it's going to be like when this does happen. I don't know a lot about this topic, but yeah, I feel like, especially there, there's a type of performance enhancing drug that's all about like getting more oxygen to your muscles, right? Like basically that enhances your endurance. 
like that that has obvious climbing implications everything else like you think about like some of the, the things that make you stronger or make you bulkier like that has pluses and minuses obviously in climbing but anything that that would help you like defeat the pump for longer i think uh i, I think would be would be a huge help um yeah i think it will happen now john like you, i know you did that article i don't know if you know too much about this but like the way that uh the world anti-doping association works in climbing right now is it the same as any other sport as far as you know like because if we haven't had a like i don't know if there's different tiers of their involvement you know maybe they're more active in and i don't know cycling where it where it, it has a history of of doping being involved so do they ha maybe they have like an increased level of of monitoring of the athletes compared to what they do for climbing because uh, i know they're in, I, they're involved in climbing right now or maybe i've got the wrong organization but like you know world cup and olympic athletes were getting tested and stuff um so they my... do yeah they do test um competition climbers high level competition climbers you know internet world cup circuit and all that as soon as if like for example the winners if, if people watching this have ever been at a world cup um you might see as soon as the person wins they are right away you don't often see this on the live stream but they're rushed <laughs> like off the stage to the to drug testing you have to submit a drug test right away as soon as you as soon as you win and um, which a lot of t sometimes is why the person is is kind of late getting to the post event interview because they're back doing their drug test. Um, they are tested. It's not it's not the same number of climbers or any athlete for every sport are tested. So it's not like the same number of cyclists are tested as climbers. It it varies by sport. To answer your question, I have no idea how they choose the percentages of athletes that are tested in a given sport. Right. Um, I I think. Some of the complications are a lot of the, I mean, this is a, talk about a topic that could use its own show, but the, part of the complication is similar to how we've talked about eating disorders before in climbing, which is that the, a lot of the, um, the, the, uh, I don't know what you'd say, like obligation or duty to punish falls on the national federations and that gets really complicated when you're talking about conflict of interest because who has the most to lose when an athlete tests positive? Of course, it's the national federations, right? Because the national federations then look bad. It's like, how could you allow this to happen in your system? How could you allow an athlete to dope and not know about it and stuff? So it's, you have to say, okay, well, do we trust these national federations to, to be honest in in testing athlete, in, puni in punishing athletes, if there is a positive test, and not trying to cover up stuff and make it seem less, especially when they have the most to lose in the situation, other than the athlete, him or herself, of course. So it gets pretty. It's 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 a real tricky topic um, without easy answers. Another thing is that the only way to really do it, um, it in other sports, this has been said, and I can't speak too much to to climbing, but in other sports, they've said you. You have to be this is like really dumb to get tested to get to get tested hot, which is they call like a positive test to test hot right after an event, a game, a competition or something like that. Because usually what happens is during the actual competition or game, an athlete is not on a cycle of doping or, or steroids or whatever at that time. They've cycled off of it. The real trick is they're they're on it during their training phases. And that is because they can recover faster. And so then they can train more, right? It's not like if you dope or take steroids or something, it's not like you automatically get stronger. You still have to train. But the thing is with, with all of these, these different drugs, they allow you to recover quicker. So then you can go back and train more. And instead of maybe training, I don't know, five days a week, now you can train seven days a week and you can train harder because your, your muscles are recovering quicker and better. So, to be really scrupulous about it, what you really need is significant year-round testing, out-of-competition testing, as they call it, and unannounced out-of-competition testing, which is the thing the athletes hate the most, of course, because you might get a knock on your door from the world anti-doping officials at three in the morning, you know, in, in some random month when you're not competing. Um, and, and, of course, athletes have to submit schedules. Here's where I'm going to be at this hour. Here's where I'm going to be on this day. In case you want to come test me, this is where to find me. It's a big pain in the athletes, but to, it's a big pain for their lifestyle. But that's really the only way to do it because 
otherwise it's it's too slippery of a system and even in the case now it's still it's always the drug testers and the and the drug testing agencies chasing the athletes chasing in other words the drugs will always be be um ahead of the the testers in terms of this game of cat and mouse right yeah that's interesting yeah yeah i feel like it'll happen at some point um but uh yeah who knows when who knows who yeah uh good question great answer john thanks for thanks for fielding most of that one man in the discord asks who do you think is the most underrated climber could be a world cup competitor or the local guy at your gym it's the most underrated climber of the current era or of any era i guess doesn't specify you can go go to town i was thinking hard about this one and and i feel like we it's in climbing we don't really underrate many people we just overrate a buttload of people I think there's just climbs like comp climbs are just so much hype all the time. It's just really, climbers are just hype machines. Like we rarely, like we rarely criticize athletes in the way that other sports do, right? Like you rarely get an athlete that just becomes a pariah, and we talk about them being like they're just not, you know, putting enough into it. They're just, you know, not in the game. Like how often, how often do we really like rib climbers? Yeah, like really, I, I can't, not very much. I can't think of many people of the current era who are underrated or underappreciated i think if you want to go back to uh, I, I think a lot of the underrated athletes to me come from eras that were pre-youtube pre-competition climbing being in this big boom first and foremost somebody like angie eider who um i think probably it's fair to say a lot of comp climbing fans nowadays don't even know her name right um and especially because the IFSC doesn't usually put out historic pieces and stuff like that. Um, there are, we, we talk about Yanya Garnbrett possibly being the best. And, and the question whenever you're having that discussion is, okay, if not Yanya, who? And a lot of these people that would be right up in there in the discussion are pretty unfamiliar to a whole generation of comp fans. I'm thinking of, of course, Angie and Sandrine LeVay and, and, and on and on. Um, so I would say, Anybody pre like 2014 that had consistent success, multiple you know dozens of of World Cup wins would probably be pretty underrated to a lot of people. I, I think that's a I think that's the probably the, the safest way to answer this, and it brings up that great point. It's like it's they're not necessarily underrated. The people that know know, but most like. The, the huge majority of climbing fans have shown up in the last few years and they've never had a chance to to watch these climbers there may not be any footage of them in like you know on youtube at all um there there's no you know and, and not to say that i think a priority for the ifsc is historical coverage just yet but it would be nice one day uh but yeah so yeah underrated might not be the perfect word for it but i think it's a good answer in this case that there are a bunch of people that people are just unaware of and mm -hmm. and haven't heard of haven't had a chance to learn about them um and it uh yeah especially regarding the yanni conversation which we've been saying for months is like do you really know what you're comparing against and mm -hmm. uh, and i think that's fair and angie's a great example of that for a uh, mad streak of yeah. uh, of world cup wins um, I, I think also you could up until this past year, uh, you could probably, I guess, put Melina Costanza on that list because she, she <laughs> oh, all of a sudden Natalia kind of, Grossman before, or, like before or, May or whenever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, but the interesting thing about Melina is that she is probably underrated or I don't know what, like you said, I don't know if that's the right word, but to a lot of people outside North America, specifically because she hasn't really done the world cup circuit right. yet here in the United States and of course the news filtering up to where you are in Canada. She's, she's just kind of the, <laughs> make, the make it sound like it came over like telegraph. Yeah. We finally, <laughs> finally got word of this movie. The, so here's, here's, here's the counter is that like, yeah, like I, I don't know if Melina or somebody like Melina is underrated. She's just unknown. But then around yeah. here, she's like overrated possibly. Cause we saw her at like what two or three Boulder comps this year. And she did really well in all of them. But again, it's really just a local field. Um, yeah. so yeah, like, I mean, she like topped every single boulder at that one comp, but that was dope as hell and super, super cool, but yeah. maybe she's entering the overrated stage, uh, here in North America, possibly. I don't know. We'll just have to see. 
Especially yeah, if she keeps only- skipping the events she says she's going to come to, which I went to to watch her, and then she doesn't show up. Melina? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> The, um, she's avoiding Plastic Weekly, clearly. Probably. The, um, yeah. the, the only other thing I'd add to this list, kind of related to what we were saying about old, you know, athletes from previous eras, would be any speed athletes prior to the homolog- you know, sure. the standardized wall. <laughs> yeah. Because their results and kind of their, their, their appreciation is, is kind of forgotten because that's not the course that we run anymore, on top of the fact that a lot of those events aren't, tele- aren't you know, live-streamed and aren't viewable and stuff like that. There's just this whole... It's like every speed climber prior to the early 2000s is kind of forgotten, which is especially wild when you look at the world championships results. And there's some that there's some speed climbers that won multiple world championships in a row. And yet, since it wasn't on this current wall, it's people don't ever talk about them. And generally, none of them are from English speaking parts of the world either. So I think on like on from our end, like we just kind of don't acknowledge the history of speed climbing. Um, yeah. we don't have those people for the most part, like in our, in our like sphere of, or in like our, our cultural sphere, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So I don't know if we answered that question very well. Like you're talking about underrated climbers and we kind of mostly talked about like unknown climbers that should be known, I guess, is kind of the angle we took. Um, so sorry if we didn't hit the nail on the head, but there's a guy named, uh, named a uh, man who's great speed climber in Canada. Maybe, uh, maybe just to make you feel better, but, um, yeah, anyway. Uh, all right. Tyson Shaney on Instagram. Will anyone, oh, okay. We got two Yanya questions back to back. Are they some, no, they're separate. Okay. So Tyson Shaney on Instagram. Will anyone get to Yanya level anytime soon? In terms of, I'm imagining Tyson, who's obviously a friend of the show. I'm imagining he means in stacking up the accolades Mm -hmm. of just like multiple world championships, dozens of, you know, world cup wins. I don't think so, because I think as competition climbing continues to get more and more popular, it just makes sense that the the level of competition is going to get steeper and, and, you know, more robust. And so it's going to be harder and harder for somebody to stay at the top consistently time after time. That's, uh, you know, that's just I mean, it that's not to say there won't be somebody that stacks up a bunch of world cup wins, but to Yanya's level and especially someone that, that stacks up Yanya's number of world championships, not Yanya's number of world cup medals, gold medals, Yanya's, you know, an an Olympic gold medal on top of that. I just, I don't, I, I don't, it's hard to imagine. Never say never. But I missed half that answer because you said time after time. And now I've got Cindy Lauper like stuck in my head. So thanks for, (laughs) Thanks for triggering that in my brain. Yeah, so I'm 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 kind of the opposite. Is like I don't know how soon it'll be, but it kind of happens. Like kind of every decade, you get somebody who is really outstanding. But the other thing you get, kind of every decade, is you'll get, and and not to say that this is like clockwork. It's just happened this way so far, and it's only over a course of like three decades. So shit sample. But um, you also get eras where you get two athletes going back to back. You get the Jane Kim. Uh, um, uh, Mina Markovic kind of thing. You get the Muriel Sarkany, uh, Liv Sansos kind of duel, right? Um, so maybe Yanya will have this era where she's really alone on top. Um, but we might have a we might have a, a nice uh, um, one two kind of sequence in the future. But I don't think it's that rare. I think for somebody like Tyson, who probably has a much better understanding. Uh, and is better at evaluating the the actual athletic ability of these athletes because I'm not that great at really like determining how good an athlete somebody is based on on how they climb. I'm really not great with that stuff. I'm really more interested in like the historical stuff and the achievements. But I think for someone like Tyson, I, I would be curious how he thinks somebody like Yanya stacks up to, let's say, like a Jane Kim Mina Markovic thing because for all we know, Yanya Garnbrett's level isn't all that different from a Jane Kim or a Mina. Maybe she's just lucky that there is nobody else of her level at the same time. And and that's a question that I'm going to have to ask a lot of other people who can evaluate it better than I can, because, you know, I look at her 2019 streak and I'm not sure that was a particularly strong field of competitors in bouldering at that time. Like she, she had very prominent results, but I'm not sure the people below her were in the best shape. I'm not sure that was a particularly strong field. So is that streak 
really that remarkable like did she win six world cups in a row over really really powerful competition maybe anna Storr's achievement which was much closer and not as dominant but she won seven of eight against a field which included a lot of world cup climbers who were also kind of at their peak age whereas yanya was kind of climbing against a mix of injured climbers very young climbers with nothing to their name and akio naguchi who is arguably towards the end of her career um, so I, I, th I think you can kind of define what the Yanya level is, but for me, I would say probably within tying it back to that, you know, like how will comp climbing evolve in the next 10 years? I bet there's somebody else that we start, you know, having the, the whispers of like a goat discussion again, whether or not it's warranted. Um, but I'm willing to bet by, by like 2030, there is another name that comes up. It's interesting to think about it, the men's division compared to the women's division, yeah, because I, f I do feel like we have had these consistent crushers in the women's division, particularly Yanya and before her, the Jain Kim and Mina Markovic. And then kind of the, the five years of the air before that would be like the Angie Eider um, or Sandrine LeVay and Angie Eider and all that. It, but like, I don't see that same sort of consistent, like that, that dominance in the men's division. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know why that is. It's just something interesting when you look at the results you don't really see in the men's a comparable competitor where it's like, oh, look, he strung together five wins in a yeah. row, ten yeah. wins in a row. You don't see that, uh, at least dating back to maybe like 2000-ish. You yeah. know, it, there are some certainly some consistent men prior to that. But at least kind of 2000 onward, you see these these women who have multiple wins in a row. You don't really see that in the men to that degree. Yeah, no, you're right. Like, I mean, the, the two standouts are Jakob Schubert and Alex Chabot I think are like the only mm -hmm. two where they like strung together a long streak of like six or seven or something wins in a row um yeah otherwise it like I think it um please put your comments in the in the sorry please put your thoughts in the comments if you have any opinions about this but it does seem like for the most part in in women's athletics you will get those kind of standout very prominent athletes every once in a while where with men maybe you just have more of them and because there's more of them at a very high level it's hard to get those cons consistent um uh streaks basically uh but that said you also tend to see men on the field longer um, you see guys that will have their first win in their late teens and then still be winning in their late twenties and, and, uh, early thirties. Whereas for the most part with women, they generally don't stay in the scene as long. Um, so you might have to look at longevity for somebody like a Jakob Schubert or, uh, 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 Remanet kind of thing for how long they stuck around and were still winning the entire time, if not tying it together in a streak. So yeah, comparing men's to women's is incredibly hard. It's so easy to pick out who those remarkable women are because they're right mm -hmm. there in the lists, like right there in the podiums. With men's, it seems like you do have to take a, a much broader um, look at things. And I'm not sure how you would find an equivalent between the two. And I think that's a, another sticking point for Yanya being the greatest of all time is how do you translate what Yanya's done to like the men's equivalent. Um, it's really hard if you want to cross genders uh, for that um, for that title. Um, I remember Alexander Chabot, who you mentioned, he won from 2000 to 2003. Those those few years, he won. I think it was like 13 of 18 World Cups mm -hmm. or something like that, which is incredible. But that was like I said, that was like 2003, 2000, 2001, 2002. So that's a long time ago, and he's really kind of the last guy that we've had stack up those kind of results that you could look at those and say like, wow, those are kind well, of Yaka, on par. Well, about like six or seven in 2011, I think, in lead. But, yeah, you but might yeah, be right. But yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, it's, so maybe what's interesting is maybe we won't see another woman um, kind of stack up the results like Yanya, but maybe we, we will see a guy – kind of rise in to, to this goat discussion over the next 10 years or something. That'd be really cool. That would be neat. I think it would be, it would be even more rare. Like it would be, yeah. it would be like a truly uh, outstanding uh, thing to see. It'd be cool to be alive for, for what's happening right now with Yanya, which is fun enough by itself, but then to see it on the men's side would be pretty, uh, uh, pretty exciting. Cool. Hard question, Tyson, but thanks man. Yeah, uh, Mr. Burns on discord and the second Yanya question uh, and we're, I think we've only got four questions left. What would Yanya have to do to be officially recognized as the greatest of all time by Plastic Weekly? Um, 
I'm just going to answer this because I feel like I'm the, and then John can have his own separate uh, thing, but I think we're pretty much on the same page. Um, I think greatest of all time is a, is too broad a title um, given how little research people have put into it. So first of all, let's, let's narrow it down. Not like I want, you know, and I'm going to have to do it, or I think John might be working on some of it from a particular angle as well. Let's start from the basics right? I'm, I'm willing to say Yanni Garnbrett is the best uh, lead climber of the day right now. I think she's also the best boulderer right now as well. So I'll give you those two, right? Um, I'm not willing to say that she is the best female climber of all time just yet. I'm not even willing to say she's the best female boulderer of all time or the best female lead competitor of all time. So I think in my opinion, for a greatest of all time discussion, you should be able to have pretty like coherent um, understanding of why they're the best in a small area, right? And I think if you say, well, maybe she's not the best at this or maybe not the best at this or maybe not the best at this, but like overall kind of overarching across multiple disciplines, she's, she's the best. And I'm not psyched on that that method. I think if you're going to be the greatest of all time, you better be the greatest of like of actually something rather than just some like grand average, right? I don't put like I'm not interested in who wins the combined, you know, season in climbing. That to me isn't interesting. Um, and I'm not interested in pretending that somebody's the greatest of all time because they've had pretty good achievements across multiple disciplines like when when people are like well yeah maybe she's not the best at bouldering or lead but you know she's the only one that's done it like you know across multiple disciplines first she's not but also the amount of athletes that you're cutting out who had incredible achievements that never would have competed in a second discipline for different reasons you're cutting out some of the other greats right like if you're saying well the greatest of all time because she did some lead and bouldering angie eider never did like a boulder competition in her life and she is definitely going to be up there when you're making that consideration of greatest of all time she just never did them she's a lead climber and she might be the best female lead competitor that we've ever seen right you can't just take her out of the discussion just because she focused on one the other thing being like boulder world cup started in 1999 like the top rock challenge in 98 so people like robin Erbisfeld and people like Liv sansos bouldering like didn't really exist on the world cup level while they were competing right Francois Legrand as well, like for, for most of his heyday where he was dominating lead climbing for men, bouldering didn't exist also. So if you're going to make a, you know, a, a proclamation that somebody's the best of all time and base it on the fact that they're versatile, like maybe we can say, yeah, Yanya is unique in that she is a very talented climber. She's maybe the, you know, the first climber we've seen to be dominant in two disciplines. I think that's a totally reasonable statement. I'm willing to say, yeah, she's the best one on the scene right now. And she's maybe the first true combined athlete, even though, you know, speed, she's probably going to forget about forever again. So we probably need to draw a, a better line of what combined means. Um, but I'm not willing to say she's the greatest competitor of all time just because she's like the first at being a truly combined athlete. I think that's like a bridge too far for me. I think to crown somebody the GOAT, like we've said before, you have to really bring the evidence and not just why she's the best, but also why her achievements are better than the achievements of the people behind her. And to do that, you have to actually know what the achievements and the quality of the people behind her are. So who is second place if Yanya is first? Who is third place if Yanya is first? Like, come on. I don't know. There's literally, there's no, there's literally no higher title we can give somebody. And we are throwing that thing out there like it's nobody's business with no justification and so like who cares what i think right like it's just my opinion if we if she's if everybody's saying she's the goat right now then i guess she's the goat that's what you know everybody's talking about whatever like there's nothing i can do about that but for me i am working my way through i'm reading right now every fucking copy of climbing and rock and ice that i can get my hands on because i wasn't watching climbing when muriel sarkany and angie eider and uh you know Susie good were climbing so i have to go back and read all these articles and find out how were people talking about them back then and why did she come second at this event and oh it was a super final at this and oh live senso stopped climbing because somebody dropped her for not using a grigri properly and it ended her competition career right it, like in the middle of her heyday 
right? We talk about Yanya having like an incredibly high floor for her results. Well, there's like, there was a period of time if you combine World Cups and like Masters events where I think Liv Sansos stayed in the podium for like 45 events straight or some shit like that. Like yeah. there's some unreal achievements out there. And the problem is we haven't really put all of our thoughts together. Um, and so I think, uh, I think Yanya could be the greatest of all time, especially if she keeps climbing. I think she's on track to be probably because her career is already matching the length of most of those other climbers I just mentioned. And so if she keeps going for another couple years or possibly all the way till she's 30, if she follows more of an Akio trajectory, I think it's a hundred percent within her reach, but to call it now, I think is too early if only because nobody's bothered to put the history together and really make the argument that I think you have to make to give somebody the, the top achievement that you can achieve as an athlete. So, yeah, you need metrics, right? Anytime you're doing this discussion, there's, there's kind of two things that need to take place when you're, when you're having the greatest of all time discussion, first of all, beforehand, you need to just shake hands with the person you're talking to and say, okay, let's agree. This is all kind of subjective, even though we can like pretend like it's not. Yeah. And so it's all kind of for fun. That's the first thing. The second thing you have to do to your point is you have to figure out greatest of all time what are our what's our rubric here what's what are the metrics we're using we're using to measure this you can't just have this vague thing and look and say yeah she's the greatest okay well like why according to what and until comp but john but john she 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 got a streak of a boulder season she won six events in a row she's the greatest boulder of all time john that is and if you want to do that metric right if you want to say the metric is sweeping a bouldering season okay let's have that be the be the metric and how in about that yeah case, how about here here's an easy thing she swept a boulder season so here you go yanya congratulations you're the only person to sweep a boulder season is that not enough of an award like do we have to like amp it up well anyway. i think the uh, one of the things if, if you want kind of the i don't know what you'd say like the mic drop moment if you want to just go by the the, the most obvious metric it would be number of world cup gold medals that is kind of the main metric we have at least until 10 years 20 years until we have like a um a history a lineage of olympic gold, gold medals right. which yeah. might become the 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 ideal metric years from now but we don't have that yet we've only had one olympics it was a wonky format um so we can use that to interpret this discussion but we can't make that the only metric so the main thing we have is world cup gold medals if that is the case Yanya has 18 in lead and 13 in bouldering. Uh, Jain Kim has 29 in lead. Angie Eider has 25, I think. I think those are the correct numbers. So in that case, what would it take for Yanya to be, to be like I said, like the mic drop moment of, of I'm just the greatest of all time in lead? Well, she has to win 12 more gold medals, right? She has to surpass Jain Kim in the number of lead World Cup golds. You're saying in that uh, discipline, right? Yeah, In yeah, that yeah, discipline, yeah. 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 If she wants to be considered the the greatest boulder boulder competitive boulder of, of all time, um, Sandrine Levey has 17, I think, gold medals in bouldering. Yanya has 13, so Yanya needs to get. I think Anna know, Anna and Akia have more than that too, so she's gonna okay. have to yeah, like so in the mid 20s if point. I remember right. Yeah, so she's gonna need to to get significantly more bouldering gold medals, and I don't say any of that to take anything away from her. I'm just saying, again, if you want to have metrics. World Cup gold is the most obvious metric, so that's where Yanya would need to go. Um, I think, or or you could say World Championship golds. I think that could be another Fuck metric them. as well. But we, you and I, have talked about. <laughs> I think the World Championship is a little f flawed as a metric because we have seen people that win a World Championship and then kind of don't really do much else with their comp competition career. So you're kind of like, well, I don't know how much we should weight a gold here because while it's a remarkable achievement at the end of the day it is just kind of one event i don't mean yeah. to demean it but it it is it's kind of like you could say a, a quarterback in football has a phenomenal game and maybe wins the the super bowl but that alone doesn't make them the greatest quarterback of all time you need you need consistency over time high consistency over time um so other than that yeah there is this wiggle room of like well but she's Yanya combines bouldering and lead and, and the gold, the Olympic gold and all this. It just gets tricky because it's like, well, how much do you weigh this weird combination of all these different aspects, especially factoring in that she's also competing in an era that has way more media and promotion than anybody 
before her. She Yanya has had way more outlets covering competition climbing than Liv Sanzos or or um, you know Angie Eider ever did. Um, Yanya has had mainstream media outlets covering competition climbing. I don't think Angie Eider was ever covered by whatever ESPN, NBC Sports, these types of things. So yeah, I don't know. I, I I didn't really answer the question, but I think I kind of echo everything you're saying that we need some sort of systematic measurement here a gauge if we're going to have this discussion right yeah well let me let me let's go back to the question because you you did a good job of just outlining some practical things because the question is what would yanya have to do to be officially recognized as the goat i don't i don't know for sure um you know i'll 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 believe it when i see it and i've got to finish up my own work because a part of it is not just what yanya does but what has everybody else done before and in what context did they do it so for me i have to learn those things first before i'm willing to to give it to yanya so yanya yanya could easily become the goat and i won't know it yet because maybe i'm not done the homework in time so that's that's totally true but like john said I would like her to be the best boulder of all time. I think she should be the best of at least one discipline of all time, which probably means she needs to get closer to the amount of wins. It doesn't have to be exactly the same amount or more. Like, you know, there are some seasons where there were more World Cups. Some athletes had an easier time winning a ton of World Cups because there were more events through certain seasons than there are now. And then there were some eras where there were a lot fewer. Like if you were getting wrecked in 2002 and there was like only three World Cups that year, like, you know, or, or speed this year, for example. You know, imagine this is the best year of uh, of uh, Kiramal uh, uh, Katabin's uh, life. Did I mess up his name? Anyway, imagine this is his peak season, right? He got two World Cups out of it, right? So mm-hmm. there, you do have to balance out some of these factors of how many events did you get, in what context, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, in general, if you want to know where my frame of thinking is, I need her to be the best at something like at least one small part of things before I'm willing to give her the whole kit and caboodle. I don't value, you know, approximate greatness over three disciplines or just over two, which makes it even more weird because we're being extremely selective now. Like, you know, she's the best all around athlete, but like kind of just ignore, ignore that other discipline. Like, I don't know. It's, that's too, uh, that's too nit. That's a, uh, yeah, that's not I, robust enough for me. Yeah. And I see, I, I see basically five different categories for metrics and it comes down to either you wait one of them, either you wait only one of them or you wait a combination of them or you have to wait them all. Mm-hmm. But the five things that I would think would be in this discussion for greatest of all time would be, as I said, the number of world cup gold medals. That's one. Number two, the number of world championship gold medals. I would, and just to say, I would probably put those two together in my thinking. Sure. Like I think, yeah, I don't think I, I, I keep working on it. I don't think I value world championships much more than like 1.5 or 1.25 times more than a world cup. It's not that much better. Um, Number three would be Olympic gold medals, um, or in this case, gold medal. We've only had one Olympics. Uh, (laughs) Number four would be undefeated season streak. Mm -hmm. And number five would be kind of the outlier for you and me, in the comp scene would be climbing the hardest grade out there. Right. Um, which we wouldn't really, for us, that wouldn't be a part of the metric because that's, that's not something we ever consider. Yeah. But, I'm just talking competitor, but I, th- yeah. I think that the one place where, where the value of like how hard you climb outside is relevant is to help kind of establish the, uh, your relative strength across generations. Cause you can make, you can make like a rough line between, okay, what were the really incredible like red point or onsite grades in 1992 compared to what are they in 2012, 20 years later, right? Like the grades have gone up. What Robin Urbisfeld did that was considered unbelievable is now a lot closer to being pedestrian than it was when she did them. Right. And so that helps kind of like, uh, help you visualize and understand the difference in the overall level that these competitors are climbing at. And it's a separate discussion, whether or not you think that's relevant. I personally think that you can only climb as hard as, as the routes that are set for you. So I, I try not to, to let that influence my mind. I, I don't personally think that I would um, dock Robin Urbisfeld points because she competed 30 years before Yanya or whatever. Um, but some people might might say, you know, Yanya is inherently the GOAT because she's competing now and now is always going to be stronger than yesterday, which if you think that's relevant, then that's fine. But I, I probably wouldn't use that in my in my thought process. 
I, I think to put a bow on this question. Probably time to, to, to yeah. <laughs> well, to, if somebody's, what would it take for Plastic Weekly to, to, for Yanya to be considered the goat? I would, I would frame it like this: if somebody was making that argument to us, which I'm fine listening to, but I would want them their argument of arguing Yanya is the greatest of all time. I want it to be informed by, and I want them to bring in, in their argument, people like. Angie and Giant Kim and and these up uh, these bring in these other competitors so I know that they're making an educated argument based on metrics rather than just kind of this vague notion of of Yanya seems to be heralded as the greatest so she is the greatest really right? everyone's just declaring her the the, the the GOMT just the greatest of my time I've been watching since 2018 and she's been the best the whole time um, yeah yeah well that's, I think that's what most point, people. I, I want if somebody's making that argument, I want them to be able to a be able to answer my retort, which would be and your retort, I would imagine, which would be, well, why not Jaine? Why not Angie? Why not Sandrine? Why not Francois Legrand? Right? Like, mm -hmm. use those yeah. We were only talking about the, the women's side, are, but that's something people should articulate. Are they talking across all athletes? Because that makes it twice as complicated. So yeah. yeah. Anyway, let's move on. Um, thank you for the it's a good question though I yeah, mean, I, brutal question. I love these the goat discussions as much as anybody i'll talk about it all day so yeah thank you mr burns for for triggering us again um more to come from both of us on that like hopefully hopefully by <laughs> hopefully by by this time next year both of us have published more thoughts uh on uh, on this topic um p Jekka? From Discord, uh, which comp finals is your all-time favorite? The one you keep going back to watch when there is no comp action, and why? Um, mine is extremely self-centered, Toronto 2015, because um, I emceed for that one, and it was a super fun comp. And uh, I just have a lot of visceral memories because I don't go to that many World Cups. So so that one being the closest to the wall that I've ever been, um, having to be right up against the wall for all three rounds and it's just much easier for me to remember and then also in that finals there was the black tape fiasco for like every single woman on that boulder um and uh and it was also Anna Storr's last win which uh which I will always remember and also Nathaniel Coleman's first podium uh won silver um so yeah that's my favorite one uh you know I have certain moments that I'll go back and watch like I love watching Mia Cramples the the knee injury um from a couple seasons ago, but the kind of kind of dark, I, but okay, I'm sure. Well, yeah, well, the knee injury that I shouldn't say the knee injury, the the kind of the the whatever you say, the resiliency to right. continue competing. Yeah, I, didn't, I don't watch the injury. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Just lately, these past few weeks, I've really enjoyed. I've watched the Salt Lake City competition a couple times when Sean Bailey won it. Again, kind of like yours, I was there, I was present. It was the first competition after the the pandemic and all that. So it was just kind of meant more than attending a normal competition. It was just really cool to be out there and a great moment. So that's, that's what comes to mind. I, I've, I like watching old, especially during the pandemic. I like watching old competitions from 2016, 17, just like random seasons, but I don't know if I have a favorite part of what I like to do is just kind of throw on a random old world cup that i don't necessarily remember the podium and just watch it i enjoy kind of being surprised or re-surprised that way rather than watching something where i already know what's going to happen that is the brutal part like because i as you watch ones like every once in a while you watch one because you're trying to figure out the context of like what you know what really happened in this world cup you know maybe the result was was a, a noteworthy result and you want to go watch it but it sucks watching world cups when you already know the result like it just makes it so like so tough yeah. When I was writing, I was writing a piece about Korean climbing and I, I watched a ton of Jain Kim's um, wins, lead, you know, lead climbs and wins from a bunch of World Cups. And so now anytime I kind of go back to try to watch those, I remember like, oh, yeah, Jain, you know, she wins this one or whatever. So right. it just kind of you're kind of spoiled a little bit. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Um yeah, and, and on that topic, we're gonna we're gonna watch some comps together on on the Plastic Weekly Discord. So uh, hop in, and uh, we'll we'll do some, hopefully over the uh, the winter holidays. Um, 
uh, and then maybe keep it going through the uh, through the season. I will probably just do nominations. We'll let anybody suggest a comp, and uh, we'll just vote on it, and then uh, watch one at hopefully a time that works for North Americans and Europeans. Uh, anyway, um, okay, we're down to the last couple. Uh, Bet Boo, I think I think her name's Elizabeth. Um, how could lead competitions be modified to enhance the viewer experience, and should it actually be implemented? Why or why not? That's, that's Big, interesting because I, I don't actually think that lead competitions are the ones that struggle with with making it engaging to viewers. I think bouldering competitions are arguably uh, harder to sell to non kind of non hardcore climbing fans because mm -hmm. the stakes are so high in a lead climb. It's, it's, you get one attempt and then you're done. Whereas bouldering, if you think about going into it as a non climber non-fan it's kind of weird it's like well they tried but they failed but wait they get to try again like what well, okay and then so i i think that the struggle for for hooking new fans is really bouldering not lead climbing i i can't say that anything really stands out that i would change about about lead in terms of the viewer experience i mean as we always say it's great to have more on-screen graphics and to be able to see where the leader is and all that and the ifsc has made improvements in that over the past year or so giving us more on-screen graphics but um i don't know yeah it's i good. like i'm i'm with you in that i between a lead final and a and a boulder final i am generally more engaged for a lead final um uh but i there's tons of people that disagree with that uh i think a lot of people just find the the moves a bit more interesting or or you know lead climbing it can be like you know if if you've already seen somebody get to a few moves at the top why would you watch the next person try and do it maybe that's their opinion um so whatever yeah i think i think the biggest thing for me is if if we're talking about for people that don't enjoy uh watching lead climbing as much as other disciplines i think the part that we have to emphasize is making sure the the context of what they're doing is important so like john said make sure that those on-screen graphics are, are telling you where they're at um, i think the commentators need to 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 make sure that every move is being compared to those that came before them and why is this next move important and what's the reward for it um I think that's where the the fun of the lead comes in is that it's it is just a build up and like can they survive right like the 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 I don't know what's a good example or it's like you know you remember I don't know if you I haven't watched Survivor in like twenty years but that moment where you know everybody is voting somebody off right so you have the moment where Jeff Probst is like pulling one name out of the box at a time right and then finally mm -hmm. it gets to the last name and like the the competitors are tied like three votes to kick this guy off three votes to kick this guy off and it's the last name and they take like twenty seconds to unveil the thing they do like it's like ten different camera angles of him looking at the thing it's that moment where it's just like you're, it's just tension. It's kind of it's while the golf yep. ball is in the air, but unfortunately in climbing, it's like five minutes of that. I, I think just trying to to amplify that feeling um, that it is just can they hold on and can they get past the next person? So yeah, the couple things I think root setters are doing a great job with with lead comps. I think the root setting is really interesting. I I have personal opinions about how lead roots should look. I think I think they should be segmented in an obvious way. So in an ideal world, I should be able to look at a lead wall and it should have explicit chapters. So as I'm climbing, you know, every couple meters it moves into a different color kind of segment or the holds are noticeably uh, uh, different and and have a different kind of uh, feel or look so I can kind of judge the progress a little bit easier and it helps you remember different parts of the climbs a bit more than if you just have like the same series of slopers and volumes up the whole way it just makes it easier for you to like be oh this is where that person fell going from the red section to the green section um, things like that but uh, mm -hmm. yeah for lead climbing I don't know have a have a clock on the screen show the progress for all of the athletes. Um, and uh, that's probably all I can think of off the top of my head. But otherwise, I like it. So I might not be the best person to, to answer it. Otherwise, yeah. just do head-to-head -head finals. But. That'd be interesting. <laughs> sure. That'd be, um, that could be exciting. I think another thing is just never underestimate the value of really good commentary. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a really good, talented commentator – I mean, they could they could make paint drying exciting, yeah. right? If 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 they're really good at what they do, and and um, so um, regardless of whether we're talking a national cup, world cup, local comp, regional, whatever you want to say, um, having a good MC or a good commentator is is essential. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Uh, last question. Uh, yeah, we've got, it's like been an hour 30 already. This is what actually went longer. I was kind of hoping we would hit an hour, but whatever. So we're not going to do extra questions. We're just going to end with this one. Alex in the discord. If you could create a comp climbing hall of fame, who would your first class consist of? And in parentheses, he says, must be retired for more than five years, eight men, eight women. Sorry, Alex, I'm not giving oh. you eight men. That's a big, <laughs> that's a big first, that's a yeah. big class. So, so first, first point is like, cause we've, I don't know if we've talked about this on air or not, but we've definitely played around with the idea of like, what would that look like? What would a hall of fame or a, a lifetime achievement award kind of thing look like um and i definitely trend towards a very infrequent very high standard for giving out that award so like if you know you you know uh things like a like a, a lifetime achievement award at like an award show for for you know movies or whatever they give one out every single year i think you could probably justify in climbing giving one of those out every like three years every mm -hmm. four years um, cause to, to what I think of as like the, the ultimate, like award deserving greatness probably comes up only every five years. Um, so yeah, I think for, for this one, I'm, I'm not going to do eight men and eight women, but okay with the retired thing. So we'll start, I, I think if we, if we're doing a first class, I would start all the way at the beginning, um, in the beginning of those world cup eras. I don't know. Maybe we can just try to do. I don't, well, you know what, let me, John, let me, let me ask you kind of where your head would go. You don't have to pick your names. I'll pick my names first, but how, how would you feel about an award like that? Like how often would you give one? I think it's fine. I think it's a, this is a cool question. So I appreciate, uh, was it Alex? Was yeah. that the name? Appreciate Alex writing in with this. You and I have talked about this. Like you said, I think if you look at other, I would, I think it would be okay to do like a, a, a person every year, but I would just keep it to one or two people. I would not do a, a, a huge field of people. And I wouldn't have any argument if you said, well, let's only do a kind of one of the big names. Let's only do it once every two years or three years or five years. Like you said, that I, that'd be fine too. I think part of the problem with some hall of fames in other sports that they fall into is that they include like multiple people every year. And then 10 years down the road, they're kind of out of people, right? That's um, what I'd be worried about. Yeah. And, so I don't think we would want to have that happen. I, I think it's also interesting in terms of criteria. If you look at other, other sports, they it's, it's, it's an interesting net that they cast in terms of who they bring into the hall of fame, the, the greats and the all time greats, because they will do, of course, the biggest names, right? So like baseball or something, it's like, okay, let's bring in Babe Ruth. Like let's bring in Mickey Mantle, these, these really huge names, but they will also do, people that were part of maybe just maybe the person didn't have a remarkable career, but they were part an integral part of like a really important game or something mm -hmm. like that, or like the first game ever played or something like, so in that sense, you could make the argument, okay, the first ever UIAA, which became the IFSC, the first ever world cup, 1989, the first ever official world cup, right? Um, let's bring in the, the man and the woman who won that they deserve to be in the hall of fame. Right. Like you could make that argument too. And you could also make the argument then for coaches, for event organizers and stuff like that, kind of people that were more behind the scenes. Um, so, I, it, yeah, it's it's kind of depends on how big of a – who do you want to bring into this Hall of Fame field? Yeah. Yeah, so I think, like, if I were to start out, let's say we hypothetically started a, a, a Plastic Weekly Wall of Fame or Hall of Greats or, you know, whatever you want to call it, I would probably – um, maybe to get the thing established, maybe I would do like three a year for a couple years just to try and, you know, get through the first decade or so, first couple decades of climbing. And then after that, just one person every couple of years and just slowly tick through them. So maybe if I, if I had to pick three, regardless of gender, um, I guess we have to work through like the nineties first, um, I don't know who are the obvious ones. If like, if we just keep it to the nineties, the first thing is there's basically no bouldering until the very end of the nineties mm -hmm. and speed is all over the place. It's like an event every year, basically just like a world championship and then a random world cup. So speed, unfortunately was, was happening a lot elsewhere, but not really in the world cup circuit. So it's super hard to judge, but there was a guy, uh, Netsvitaev. So anyway, let's, I guess, you know, the nineties are probably defined by lead. So let's start with lead. I would probably say, 
out of the men's, Francois Legrand for being the first dominant men's athlete in World Cup climbing. Probably. Yeah. I, Go ahead. I was going to say Francois and uh, men and women, probably Francois Legrand and, and Robin Herbisfield, I yeah. guess. Those would be the most logical one, too. I think they're the, uh, like the initial kind of like World Cup royalty. Mm -hmm. Um uh, you know, uh, I think that would be a fair start for both of them. And I mean, that's kind of like an, maybe kind of like an easy, uh, uh, an easy answer. And after that, it gets a bit more difficult, but I was going to say, I just wanted to look at the speed events really quick just to see who, uh, who might've been like super dominant. If you can say that early on, so there was one or two names, um, on the men's side, what was it? Is it Vladimir Netsvetayev, um, across like 1993 and then stretching out through the late nineties again was showing up a lot. So that might be somebody, but my context for like speed at that point is like so limited. Um, yeah. I've read barely nothing on it. There's very little coverage from the Western world on that stuff at that era. So um, yeah, pretty limited. Okay. Well let's, let's, let's double it up then. We'll do, we'll do uh, two men, two women just to, to make up for it. So I would say, yeah. Uh, so we already said, um, uh, Robin Herbisfeld and, uh, Francois Legrand. I mm -hmm. think the next interesting male athlete that comes up is one of the other Francois, Francois Petit. I think he's mm -hmm. the next one. And then for women, uh, and I think because the relationship and the generational, uh, 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 divide between the two is interesting. I think Liv Sensos would be my next one for the women. Yeah, um, I think the interplay between herself and Robin and how how that kind of uh, was a, a kind of a defining change in the type of climbers that we saw. I think that would be an interesting duo. Those might be my first two. For yeah, I, women. I think those are fine. I think with Liv, you're kind of pushing into the early 2000s there, um, which is I, I don't have any argument with either of those. Um, I think going back to my what I said earlier about the, the only main metric we have right now is world cup gold medals, the, or the, the most obvious metric in that case, you, I think you'd be hard pressed to say that giant Kim does not deserve to be in the hall of fame. Now, granted, we said, you know, they have to be retired for five years yeah. and, and I don't, I don't know if she, I don't even she know might if not she's even be retired, retired. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but in terms of, I mean, if you just want to kind of put in a more recent name and, and especially someone that, by the numbers has more than anybody else. Um, I, th I think you could put Jain in there. Yeah. I feel like a lot of the names we mentioned in the Yanya discussion are, are the, like the other ones on the women's side, which we talked about. So, yep. you know, Muriel, Angie, um, yeah, maybe, uh, Mina and, uh, and Jane and later on, you know, Anna and, uh, Anna and, and Akio haven't reached the retirement threshold just yet, but yeah, for yep. men like Francois and, uh, Xi Xin Zhang. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you could bring in organizers and Schubert. You know, I, I mean, I, th I think you could argue that, that the founding members of the IFSC or the founding members of the UIAA's competition division deserve a spot in there. Certainly somebody like Graham Alderson or somebody like you could make a case that this person has been integral to competition climbing ever since, arguably ever since it really became a global thing. Um, so. Yeah. I probably wouldn't deal with that stuff just cause I'm, I, I, I'm not enough of a judge myself. Like I haven't been involved in any of that world. So I feel like, honestly, I feel like that the IFSC should have their own, just like, although it may be extremely political, they should have their own kind of recognition of people that have contributed to the, the uh, organizational, you know, event side of things. I think that would be appropriate because yeah, there's a bunch of people that have been around since day one. Yeah. Um, and they should probably, uh, be recognized for that. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's kind of the end of the questions. There are Good some stuff. more, but, uh, we'll, we'll move on from it. There is actually, there was, there was, uh, um, uh, a couple of these we're going to save for the future. Um, but one I wanted to throw out there, uh, if you could hang out with any climber dead or alive for a day, who would you choose? Ooh. Oh man. Um, I, I will say that when I was writing my, 
So uh, the winner of the first ever snowbird competition in 1988 in the men's division was Patrick Elanger, mm-hmm. and he is sadly no longer around. And so when I was writing my book, snowbird, that competition was so pivotal to the history of American competition climbing in particular. And when I was writing the book, I, my book, I was just like, oh, I, I just wished I could have talked to him and kind of get gotten his insider perspective on not only his career, but that competition in particular and, and just what he he kind of had this interesting relationship with competition climbing where he he wasn't really he didn't really love it but of course he he won that event which was such a pivotal event so it's kind of this interesting dynamic of not really loving comp climbing but also being a historic part of comp climbing and and stuff so uh i yeah i'd love to uh, it's really sad i wish i w- could have talked to him that's a great answer yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that where I ended up was with Johanna Ernst, just for having such like an unbelievable start, um, just like instantly winning a World Cup first year of eligibility. I think it was her first event too, just like boom, win. Like kind yeah. of what kind of what Orient could have been, but everybody was like, wait, what? What if this happens, right? Uh, but then of course Johanna just like disappeared, um, and uh, I, I would love to to know more about that. And uh, yeah, so maybe one day. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's uh, let's Good wrap po- this. I, I- I'd ask people if they, I, you and I talked about this off screen, but this is kind of the first time we've done this mailbag type of episode. Um, you know, we did it kind of at the tail end of another episode one time, but this is the first time we've devoted an episode to it. So if people give us some feedback, if people like this, we can do it more. If people don't like it, we won't ever do it again. Yeah, exactly. We've, we've been doing the debrief for three years and we've only done it once. So worst case scenario, we'll, we'll do it three years from now. Um, but, but yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you for, uh, for submitting your questions. Um, debrief will be, will be, uh, uh, less frequent now until the, until the world cup season starts back up, but you can expect, uh, some more interviews coming up, uh, on this channel and also with John involved, hopefully if we can wrangle some, uh, some dates, uh, for that stuff. So make sure you stay tuned, uh, join the plastic weekly discord where you can just chat about whatever we're talking about, uh, about comp climbing or gym climbing. Um, of course you can support on Patreon, uh, and, uh, subscribe to the channel for, for whatever comes next. Uh, John, did you have anything else to say or, or are we good? I just forget how to end shows. Yeah. Nothing else to month. say, nothing else to plug the, the, I will say the American, um, the national championships are coming up early November, which I believe I haven't heard otherwise. I think they're going to be live streamed on YouTube and stuff. So, um, people can tune into that should be be exciting yeah yeah all right well if you want to watch that stuff join us on uh in the discord server uh and we'll uh, we'll chat about it anyway thanks very much for watching uh and we'll see you in the next one